What I'd like to do as the uh, physician, with my eminent surgical colleagues, is really just set the scene first of all and just give a little bit of an overview of um, adolescent injuries, the issues that are involved and, and a, just a, a touch on some of the particular injuries that we see. So what are the key issues? It will come as no surprise that obviously we're dealing with skeletal immaturity. We're also dealing a lot of the times with really quite varying sizes and maturity of our athletes, particularly in team sports, and that can cause issues. And along with that, we've got underdeveloped motor skills, uh, perception and coordination and motor patterning, which I'm sure the physios, in the, as you all know. And then the big thing is the growth spurts. These are when the injuries really um, are, are really problematic. So what makes them vulnerable? Well, it's obviously the shearing forces that are going through the growth plates and also the traction forces at the apophyses, and particularly that vulnerability at, at growth spurts. So why is it at growth spurts? Well, we know that there's an association between peak height velocity <coughs> and fracture rate. And, and why is that so? Is that's because there's a dissociation between how strong the skeletal uh, architecture is uh, and, the, and the expansion of the skeleton. And that is going to lead to weakness. We also know at the same time, it's not just about the bones. So a lot of work um, it, with Hewitt and uh, Ford in America um, with the sensory motor function. And we know that that may, um, it's not mature and it may actually decrease at these peak um, growing spurts. And with that, we, there's a lot of work. You know, my particular interest, obviously, working in women's football has been ACLs. Um, and interesting paper by Wild showed that quads seem to strengthen and the knee, there's increased laxity um, between, uh, at these growth spurts with females, but the hamstrings are, aren't getting strong at the same time. So you've got that dissociation there. And that may be, there's lots of factors. There's a whole talk in ACL um, risk factors, but that's... You know, it's an interesting putting that into context for this, for this talk. The biggie, though, with adolescence is loading. And I can't, you know, shout this um, loud enough. Don't underestimate, you know, just because you may not see an elite athlete in front of you, don't, underest don't underestimate yeah, how much loading they do. Think about doing a training diary. You know, try and qualify and quantify how much they're doing. They're doing it at the school, at the club, at the county, international. You tot all of that up, and they're putting a lot of forces through an immature body. And it's not uncommon that you're, you're going to see young people that are training, you know, 20 hours plus per week. Put it into context, there are elite gymnasts will be doing age 12, uh, three, four hours a day, N no question. And that, to some extent, you could argue that's what they need to do. Um, and that's purely gymnastics. That's not just what they're doing then back at their schools, etc. Also have a think about what <coughs> load they're putting through specific joints. And I'll go into that a little bit more in detail in a minute. And obviously, as physios in the room, I don't need to tell you about you know, the muscle imbalances, leg length discrepancy, different range of motions um, around joints all have their factors and it may be really quite minor but you think about that joint loading and loading and loading with an imbalance then there, there may well be a, an issue and then lastly the thorny issue of you know technique and coaching error um, don't go you know gung-ho into that otherwise the coach will tell you where to where to go but you know think is that going to be uh, an issue here the other factors, however, that are key to any athlete, uh, and certainly, um, perhaps, especially to adolescents, what are they putting in their body? You know, is their nutrition um, good enough to sustain the loading that they're putting through their body? Simple, simple things. You know, are they are they having their breakfast? You know, are they putting a little bit of protein in um, to their bodies after after they train? It, it can be as simple as that. And don't don't think that just because they've got to a high level you know, they know what they're doing. Sleep is something that I think we, we don't ask enough about with all of our athletes, and there's a lot of um, interest in that at the moment. 
and certainly as a, a, a mum of 21 and 18 year olds and so past their adolescence now I, I know full well do adolescent kids sleep properly no of course they do don't you know come home they're on their iPads on their phones they don't get enough sleep for sure so what is that having um, uh, what effect is that having on their rest and recovery um, and obviously there are other stuff going on in their lives you know they've got you know the other stresses going on in their lives with with uh, school work and relationships etc etc so what effect is that having and of course when dealing with an adolescent athlete you're not just dealing with that athlete you're dealing with the parents which can be challenging and you're dealing with the coaches and then you also have to think right well I've got a 15 year old in front of me but how mature is this 15 year old you know is this 15 year old footballer the same as a 15 year old gymnast no very very different um, so what is their cognitive their emotional um, maturity so a little bit the, the, the issues that I wanted to just key in with a little bit ACLs, uh, concussion, and just touch on uh, physial injuries. What do we know about ACLs? It's a biggie out there. You know, you only have to look at the states where they collect the data at high schools. There's a lot of ACLs going on. It is a season-ending injury for sure. However quick you think you're going to get your rehab, it's the season's over for that athlete. We know that it is particularly risky for injury for women and different papers you get different um, uh, ratios is somewhere between two and six times more common but it's particularly more common it seems to be in the adolescent female there's a there's a peak at that uh, age range whereas for men it tends to be a little bit older and we know that whether you get it operated on or, or not <coughs> you're at risk of osteoarthritis so the big queries are with the management of an adolescent ACL is first of all do you operate on them um, or not and there's some uh, increasing um, uh, slant that, that we, we're not operating on all ACLs these days it depends on what your athlete or your patient wants to get back to and particularly with adolescent um, ACLs how mature is this athlete? have their growth plates fused or nearly fused. If they're nowhere near fusing, then you may well think about, actually, we need to hold fire, we need to rehab this person, um, and then contemplate surgery later on down that line. If, they're if, they're, if you're gonna go down the operative route, then that's where the graft choice uh, becomes uh, an issue, in that if there are nearly fused growth plate, you don't wanna be putting bone patella bone through that growth plate and uh, fusing the growth plate um, uh, prematurely. Concussion, um, it will continue to be a hot topic as it's, you know, uh, the armchair, um, you know, we're all, we're all medics on, uh, in our armchairs. Um, so it's a big, it's a big issue uh, and it's a big issue particularly with adolescents for various reasons. One, because the signs can be even more subtle uh, than in adults. So one of the signs, if you're not aware, is, um, for example, being more emotional. Um, anyone, uh, any of you with um, teenage kids, yeah, how on earth do you tell whether they're more emotionally labile than they normally are? Yeah. So the signs can be really quite subtle. Um, recovery may well take uh, longer. Um, kids, you know, it said, can be more susceptible. Um, and there is this thing, unfortunately, called second impact syndrome, where you get a second impact and your brain suddenly swells. It is extremely rare, however, it does happen. Is it Northern Ireland, a rugby boy <coughs> passed away not that long ago because of second impact. So we, take, we have to take it very, very seriously. So finally, facial injuries. Um, I'm not gonna go into traumatic because that's what my orthopedic surgeons um, deal with um, more the the overuse um, issues and we're just going to go through a couple elbows for me you know we are now not designed to weight bear through our upper limbs uh, and yet our gymnasts obviously do to a great deal uh, and the thing that we see in gymnastics are these uh, capitalum chondral damage um, 
You get pain, it can be actually quite subtle. Do you get swelling? You may get a little bit. You get decreased range of motion. That's the thing that I certainly found. And again, it can be really subtle, um, but you know that's the thing to, to look out for. <coughs> yes, they can catch or click or you know have grinding, give way if it's significant. Obviously, if you get true locking, and I've had n equals one of that, um, then you know what you're dealing with. But again, it can be really quite subtle that you just your elbows are a bit achy and maybe a little bit stiff. But the big thing is for me, you've got to detect it early and you've got to offload it early. Once you get a gymnast or any athlete that's got issues going through their elbow, then they're in trouble. This is where you know liaising with a coach, coaches really does uh, is important because it may well be it's something particularly they're doing in their bolt or handspring, whatever, um, that is putting them at, at risk. And it's all about can their body sustain uh, the movements that they're putting themselves through. So it's all about their strength and, and control. And then the other one is the, is the wrist. So, you know, gymnasts can put up to 16 times their body weight through their wrist. Trampolinists put 13 times their body weight through their whole body when they're doing trampolining. That's something I had no concept of before doing gymnastics. It's a hell of a lot of forces going through your body. So with wrists, um, it's the distal radius stress reaction and the impaction of the scaphoid that they get. Yes, they also get some impingement and capsulitis dorsally uh, because of their extension. Mm. And again, it's detecting it early and just offloading them or just altering their <coughs> load. The gymnasts use these things called panda paws that just take some of the impact um, for them. And certainly one of our top gymnasts had surgery after um, Beijing and she continued to wear her panda paws and was absolutely fine into, into London. Again, it's coaching technique, where, how, are they, how are they loading, where are they putting their um, position of their hands, particularly on the bolt. And again, it's about that strength and control through, through that upper limb, but also you know, their core strength, etc. What I'm not really going into, but you, know, you know as well as I, that we do deal day-to-day uh, -day with all of these um, traction apophyseal um, issues, the Osgoods, uh, the severs at the ankle, the single leg glass, and uh, again at the knee. Um, for me, they're, they're manageable conditions. They, they should never be so unmanageable that they would ever need any kind of surgery. They should be dealt with simple, modified loading, and that shouldn't be, should not be an issue. Uh, the avulsions that we see in adolescents, Again, depends on how far they go bolts from whatever bony um, landmark, um, but again, can certainly be dealt with um, conservatively. And I mentioned in passing, because we've got uh, Damien talking, but the spondies. Again, for me, it's all about the loading, understanding the loading, offloading them early. Um, just to share with you, one of the things that we did with British Gymnastics um, was just to look at all the spondies that we've had, and stiffness seemed to be a really early in um, marker for us so if any of our gymnasts were just complaining a bit of stiffness why would a really mobile um, sometimes hypermobile gymnast be complaining of stiffness that was like an early little warning sign physios um, would deal with that and they've had n equals one spondy in the last year which is just amazing for, for gymnastics and the other thing with with kids remember the other pathologies you know we do occasionally see see the nasties so think about inflammatory and think about the tumours. Thank you, that's all I've got to ramble on about. Forgive me if I degenerate into ranting. Um, this is a, a, an issue that I have a passion for. Um, I see five or six adolescents a week with sports-related back injuries. By the time the children come to see me, and I call them children if they're under 18, I'm going to call them children because that reinforces that we do actually need to treat them as children. Um, they've often been through the mill. They've seen a variety of practitioners. They've seen GPs. They've been told things by their coaches. And um, they've been told different things by everybody. And the, f the families come in with great confusion and worry. To do with the spine, there's not much evidence-based practice. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of what's done routinely doesn't work. And patients become labelled. You've got a bad back, you can't play sport anymore, which is a real shame. 
I always get the opportunity to say this, but the nice guidelines, you, all you need to do is read the first sentence. Here, non-specific low back pain is tension, sores, and or stiffness in the lower back for which it is not possible to identify a specific cause. I mean, is there any other part of medicine where the guidelines are, we're going to tell you how to manage something when you haven't bothered to find out what's wrong with the patient? It's like chest pain of unknown cause. Red flags, put them up there. I guess everybody knows those. They are useful. Um, anyway, pain in, in kids um, playing sport can be due to their structure. If you look at the children who develop spondylolysis, which is obviously most of what I'm going to relate to, if you screen them, you would see which ones are going to have a spondylolysis. The superior articular process of the distal um, vertebra should be a triangle like that. If it's a triangle like that, it's more like a chisel, and they're the ones that fracture, and we'll, we'll see that with the scan later. Function is clearly important. None of, I'm not talking about elite now. The vast majority of the kids that I see aren't elite. I mean, I see them from the football academies and whatever, but most of them are, they play a lot of sport at school. They have no core strength whatsoever. None at all, and it doesn't form any part of their training. So function's hugely important. Or is it a disease? And that's when you come back to the red flags. Now, inappropriate training program intensity. We'll come on to that in a moment. Overplaying. And these are things that the kids, you know, their children, they're supposed to be told what you can and can't do. You know, I want to play football three hours a day. No, just say no. But somebody's either not saying no or encouraging them to do more. And you've got to use your common sense. Um, inappropriate exercise programs, we'll come on to that. Free weights in 15-year-old rugby players. Um, not resting injuries. And treating sports injuries in childhood as adult sports injuries. Well, they're not, you know. Now, training program intensity. This is just, I, I always ask, I spend quite a long time going through each with, with these children, what their training program is. So, school rowing program. See, loads of young people with back pain rowing. They spent, this is in a week, eight hours in a boat, four hours on an erg, three hours free weights, and this is a 15 year old, one to two hours of circuit training, 30 minutes of core a week, and if you ask them, that's probably kettlebells, <laughs> and then they row competitively. And that seriously is the kind of thing that's done. Not everywhere, but a lot of the more successful schools. School rugby program, Six hours of pitch training, so running around with the ball. Again, two to four hours of weight training. Again, that's probably going to be free weights. They'll do 30 minutes of fitness and core. And again, they'll play for two to four hours a week. Now, kids with back pain who do a lot of sport, the diagnosis is in the history. It's not in the investigations, rarely. You don't even have to examine them. You're pretty much going to have the diagnosis before they've even taken their clothes off. Common things are common. Common things, spondylolysis, stress reactions, stress fractures are the commonest thing in adolescent sports. Disc issues are, are less common, but still the next most common, and it does depend on the sport. And back to the flags again. Taking the history, the first questions you ask aren't necessarily what your training program is, it's, is your appetite okay, is your weight steady? Do you feel well? Those are the things that get asked before you ask the things that you think are relevant. Now, spondylolysis, and when I refer to children here, it's small children. Small children under the age of eight or nine um, who develop spondylolysis don't complain about pain. So they won't tell you anything. It's not true in adolescents and ad ad athletic adults. They will have pain. If you develop a spondylolysis as an adolescent, they will have some symptoms. The more athletic they are, the more elite they are, probably the less symptomatic they will be because they have a, a huge um, degree of play in the system. They can get away with it. Football. Uh, most of the, the, the people I see with spondylolysis um, at elite level are footballers just because I see footballers. That doesn't mean it's the most common sport for spondylolysis. But it is common in footballers, particularly if they play a lot on um, AstroTurf. Um, particularly if they have an erect running style. 
you made a list of the sort of Premier League footballers who've had spondylolysis in the last four or five years, and you look at videos, it's the ones who run upright with their head up, looking for where they're going to pass the ball. It's the ones that run like their coaches tell them to. They fracture. And also, it's the ones who take loads of throw-ins, which isn't surprising. Cricket, that's obvious. The bowlers, that's a, a, an athletic exercise designed to give you a stress fracture. <laughs> Rowing. Rowing is more disc issues. You've got to have a pretty peculiar rowing technique to get a spondylolysis, unless it's training related, and that's weights in the gym. Disc issues, I can't remember when it was, that's probably 30 years or so ago, a group of Swedish medical students um, volunteered, had needles put into their discs and they were made to do a variety of exercises and the needles were connected to pressure transducers. And the single exercise that produced the greatest rise in intradiscal pressure was sitting down with your legs straight, bent forward, pulling with your arms. <laughs> that sounds familiar. You're horse riding in children, I'm not going to say anything about this because it's traumatic, but um, the single highest cause of paralysis due to spinal injury in the UK is horse riding. Gymnastics, well, Pippa's talked about this and again knows far more of this than I do. This is definitely designed to break you back. You know, and it's, it's the repetition, but we, what's the incidence? 60% or something in theory? So you've got a sport where 60% of the participants develop stress fractures, which has been addressed, but that's quite remarkable. Tennis. Um, stress fractures in tennis players, um, if they're right-handed, tend to get right-sided lower lumbar stress fractures, spondylolysis, because they overhead the serve. Um, if they're left-handed, they tend to get them on the left. Snowboarding, I just think, well... Deserve any injury they get, really. Um, now, back pain in an adolescent athlete is a pars fracture until proven otherwise. Um, and that's what it has to be. If the pain doesn't settle quite quickly with rest and simple pain relief, then they should be investigated because a mild stress reaction. If it's ignored, turns into a fracture, it turns into nine, 12 months of interference with their life and issues in the future. Repetitive loading and extension is important. Sports affected, we all know these. The common ones. Now, um, so, child comes in, back pain, play sport. What do you think of spondylolysis? Well, after the red flags, spondylolysis, pars pedicle reaction. Then what do you think of? Spondylolysis, pars pedicle, mm. stress reaction. Then you can start thinking about the other things. Okay, I'll put tumours down here, but that's only to remind you because you already thought about that at the beginning. These are my hobby horses, and of course these are generalisations and maybe complete rubbish, but don't diagnose sacroiliac dysfunction in a child. You'll almost always be wrong. If a child has back pain, it's not going to be sacroiliac dysfunction. They, they, they've got an injury, probably. And it might be sacroiliac dysfunction, but you won't have missed the injury. Idiopathic scoliosis. Decent number of kids that you see will have a scoliosis. It does not cause pain. Scoliosis does not cause pain. If a child has scoliosis and pain, they've got something else as well as the scoliosis. It's not the scoliosis. The only time that that's true is if the curve's beyond 50 degrees, and then they start to get facet joint overloading. But unless they've got a gross scoliosis, Ignore the scoliosis, there's something else going on. Piriformis syndrome, unbelievably rare in children. Oh, they're too bendy. I think kids have been treated for months for piriformis syndrome. I, mean, I, I think it's overdiagnosed anyway, but in kids it really, I, I don't think that's something that should be at the top of anybody's list. Um, and I don't think there's, long, there's any place for long courses of manual treatment in children if they're not improving or long courses of any kind of treatment in children if they're not improving without investigation. Uh, so what's a stress fracture? Well, basically the bone breaks with a load that shouldn't have broken the bone because it's been loaded too much too often. Um, this is Mark Wotherspoon's um, picture, that's horrible. Yeah. So spondylolysis in the, um, so fracturing the um, pedicle, Pars junction, 
And what, uh, it's not a very good picture here. This is the superior articular facet that I was talking about earlier. And you can see that it's quite a rounded triangular shape. In the, the, the youngsters who get fractures, it tends to be quite peaked and triangular, so they're genetically predispositioned towards this happening. Now, not to the degree that you could justify CTing everybody in a football academy to see if they're going to fracture, but disproportionately represented. So these are different sports. Um, normal population, 3 to 6%. Athletes, 8% all the way up to the higher, indi uh, higher uh, degrees for the, the sports that involve a lot of... Well, it's not really a sport, but um, yeah, Eskimos get a lot of spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> okay, so we've done history and then it's examination. Um, so you've got an iceberg here and investigation is only the little bit on top and everyth everything else below is what gets you your diagnosis. Now, this is what somebody looks like with a spondylolisthesis, so where the bones actually slip forward. They get short hamstrings, they lose the lumbar lordosis, they've got a simian stance. You're not going to see that in a child with a stress fracture. X-ray. I don't x I mean, again, sweeping generalisation, I don't x-ray children with low back pain. It's radiation without information a lot of the time. If they've got a stress reaction, or a small undisplaced fracture, it's quite likely the x-ray will be normal. Um, it'll only show up an established fracture, by which time you should already have made the diagnosis and be managing it. You might use x-rays to monitor their progress, but I wouldn't say it's a primary investigation. And it's the, the old-fashioned thing of the Scotty dog. Scotty dog. So you have the nose, the ear, its back, its neck, and if it's got a collar across the neck, it's got a stre they've got a spondylolysis. Uh, MRI magnets, that would be my primary investigation. Now, I know, you know that's not out there in, in, in your treatment rooms, but I think it is the primary investigation. Um, and you pick up high signal bone edema within the, the vertebra in the pars or the pedicle. So you'll pick it up before they fracture. If you pick up that they've got a, a, a stress reaction within the vertebra and they have significant pain, I think you have to take the investigation forward because it won't tell you whether they fractured or not. And that does make some difference. It does affect how you're going to take things forward. CT scans, obviously you can see the pals fractures clearly. This is an old one. Uh, and over there's an old one as well. I use CT if they've previously got a positive MRI scan to assess whether it's fractured and you do a very limited CT of the vertebra you've already identified to be abnormal so they're not getting a huge dose. Because you need to know, is this just a stress reaction? So it's the honeycomb in the crunchy bar that's broken but the crust hasn't yet, in which case rest will settle it all down, it'll all happen quite quickly in a matter of maybe six or eight weeks. Is it a partial fracture, in which case protect it, you don't want it to become a complete fracture and it's likely to unite with no problems in the long term, or is it a complete fracture, in which case you know they're going to be out for 9 to 12 months probably with this, and you've got to be careful to make sure that it unites properly. Bone scans, a lot of radiation for a child, so this would only be used if you've got a really high index of suspicion and the other investigations have been normal. <clears throat> Spec CT scan um, is very good for picking up mild um, stress reactions in the bone and uh, locating them anatomically if they haven't been picked up on MRI. But to be honest, MRI now should really pick these up. Blood tests don't really have any place to play in this. Invasive therapy, so you know, maybe they are a nail and you are a hammer. So, escalator of treatment. They're Basically, rest, pain relief, and don't operate on them. Rest. If a child is playing sport and they have back pain, they stop playing sport. They stop. They are shut down apart from core rehab, functional, avoiding extensions. So isometric work initially. I'm not going to go on a lot about the how to rehab people. You know more about that than I do. But basically, it's an extension-loading injury, so don't rehab them by loading an extension. 
Now, the problem with Planck and Pilates on a reformer, if you don't do them properly, you end up loading in extension. So got to be careful with that. But I can't reiterate, you rest, you rest, you rest, you rest, you rest, you wait till it stops. They come back to the clinic, I want to play football. Does it hurt? No. Mum, yes it did, you had to have some paracetamol yesterday. Well then go away and come back when it stops hurting. Um, physio, what's your role with all of this if you're a physiotherapist? Well, conditioning, rehab, stand up to personal trainers or coaches in this case, treat the core. Got to be strong and flexible. Obviously, these people, these 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 children have to be strong and flexible. Chiropractic. Um, I've had chiropractic work brilliantly. I had sciatica. Got on the the uh, couch with sciatica. Got off without sciatica. I think it's brilliant. But I think in children with sports-related pain, we really need to know what the cause is before they're manipulated. And I know chiropractors do other things, but the manipulation pop. Um, part of this I think we really need to be careful with. Same for osteopathic treatment, very valuable. I think we need the diagnosis. Um, do you need somebody with a hammer? Well, if you're a nail. Do you need a, an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon? Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, you could have traction. Manage expectations. Often it's the parents. <laughs> They're training too much. It's the coaches, they're training too much. The kids often just want to play sport with their friends. It has to heal. You have a broken bone, it has to heal. You have to wait until it heals. And if it takes nine months or a year to heal, it takes nine months or a year to heal. Be realistic. If these kids are getting repeated stress injuries, spondylitis, one of them, but other things, pick your sport. Maybe drop one or two sports. Be sensible. Don't try and be good at everything. I hate little <coughs> bit. Um, that's better. Um, I'm a massive fan of functional rehab using um, functional movements with pulleys. I think it's a great idea. Um, and for the kids as well, I mean, virtually no weight. Obviously not when they're acutely um, in pain. Um, you know about that. Surgeries at the bottom. In 15 years, I've repaired <coughs> one child with a pars fracture. And I've seen many hundreds. Children with stress reactions needing surgical fixation is a failure of conservative management or a failure of patience with a C. Um, you've just got to wait and they'll heal. You have rehab programs that can be sport related. This is the cricket rehab program, which I've shown before, um, from, I think from the ECB, which is very good, um, very thorough, um, activity related, great return to sport, and return to sport's the key with this. And I'm a surgeon, I'm not the one to decide how they return to sport. That's you, that's Pippa, it's not me. But that's the key. There's nothing worse than my back hurts, it got a bit better, so I went out and played and it now hurts again. You know, functional progressive return to play. Surgical repair. As I said, this is, there are probably 50 different operations to repair pars fractures, which tells you that none of them work properly or everyone would do one. You've got an arthritic hip, you have a hip replacement. You've got a pars fracture, you can have flexible rods inserted, you can use <coughs> laminar hooks, you can put pe uh, pedicle screws, you can put pars screws, you can do it percutaneously, you can do it open. And the reason everybody tries different things is none of them are great. Whatever you do will impinge on the facet joint that's adjacent to that. It will damage the capsule. You damage the capsule of a joint, it leads to the joint degenerating. So you are storing up problems for these children in the not too distant future. You put a, a screw up the pars. The pars is a tiny, it's probably only four or five millimeter diameter bony cylinder with mostly cortical bone and virtually no cancellous bone, which is why it broke in the first place. You put a screw up the middle of that, it now has no cancellous bone. So they often don't unite and then the screws break and they have pain and a broken screw and a non-united pars fracture. Now that doesn't mean that it's never needed, but it is very, very rarely needed. 
And if it means nine months or a year off sport, it means nine months or a year off sport. They're children, they've got the rest of their lives ahead of them. They don't need to get back. Um, so, my role in this is pretty much just to tell them not to play sport and to reinforce that from the position of, well, I've taken you to see a surgeon and he said you need, you need to stop playing sport. That's pretty much my role. My, my daughter, she's, uh, she's very beautiful, yeah. right, like every dad would say, and uh, so she had some braces and, uh, to straighten out her teeth, and she looked, uh, then we had the brace came off, and uh, then she decided to do boxing training, <laughs> which is exactly what I didn't want, eh? so, and uh, then she came out of the boxing training, and then she went to, into rugby. <laughs> so the only thing that I want to do, the only thing that I want to see my daughter do is, is athletics. Yes, uh, uh, but uh, but unfortunately, um, she's not doing any boxing or rugby training anymore, so I'm happy. <laughs> so, um, the definition of, of uh, adolescent uh, from the WHO is, is uh, any person between the age of 10 and 19. The, the most important question to ask when you see uh, you, somebody with, presenting with a hip problem is actually what age she has. And, um, and you can see that if, if, you, if you ask that question, you can exclude a lot of conditions. And see, um, the x axis shows the age, and you can see between the age of 10 and 19, you only have a, a limited amount of conditions. Um, from 10 to, uh, let's say, 17, you see slip capital femoral epiphysis. That's a condition that you do not want to, want to miss. Femoral impingement is the most common hip condition uh, that starts from the, from the age of 12. And dysplasia is the condition that runs all the way through. And, and it can present at different age groups. So, so those who are not picked up at birth because they have a congenital hip dislocation or they have difficulties when they start walk, walking can sometimes present around the age of uh, uh, 13, 14, 15 when they have mild dysplasia and when they start to engage in sports activities and then also present some symptoms. Pertus disease usually stops before the age of 10, so you can forget about that. And femoral neck stress fractures probably start to occur from the age of 17 upwards, but, it, but it's probably more something that you see uh, in, in an older age group. Uh, uh, in an adult group and, and, and predominantly in, in uh, sports like running and, and, um, and in the military. This is a, an MRI scan of, a, of a, an adolescent. You can see very nice with the growth plates um, between the epiph epiphysis and the, and the, the, um, uh, the femoral neck. But you also can see the, the growth plate here of the, of the rim and uh, you, you can understand that in those patients who have, for instance, abnormalities that, that it can stop diffusion of the rim and we can get like what we call rim fractures or an acetabulary. Here you can see very nicely the growth plate of the great trochanter and, um, and this is an example where you can see the growth plate uh, between the uh, os ilium and uh, os ischium. And those, th those growth plates in the acetabulum usually fuse around the age of 14-15. As I said, the condition that you don't want to miss is a slipped capsule femoral epiphysis. What happens is that your, the patients have a fracture through the uh, growth plate and the, the epiphysis slips medially and posteriorly. <coughs> the age group between 10 and 17, it's uh, often associated with hormon, hormonal abnormalities, radiation treatment uh, with uh, chemo, steroids, a family history of uh, slipped capsule femoral epiphysis. It often occurs bilaterally, so if they had it on the on the other hip, then you might have to think about it. So it's more frequent in boys than in, than in girls. And um, often in, in um, uh, boys that are a bit overweighted uh, for their height. So they start to complain about limping. Um, limping can be intermittent. Sometimes there is a trauma. <coughs> they have hip end. They can also have knee pain. Often when they sit, you see that they actually, the leg turns out. When they have have the on both on both uh, sides and they can walk uh, with a waddle. So I think uh, I'm a big fan of X-rays as the first call uh, for any hip conditions. 
especially in a child with, with, uh, that starts to limp, it is really important that you, that you take x-rays. And the views that you want to take is an, an AP pelvis and a Launstein or uh, a frog leg lateral, uh, and you have to take both hips because of the incidence of the bilaterality. But it's a commonly misdiagnosed, and it usually takes about three months uh, on average before the correct diagnosis is made. And uh, at that stage, you can already have lost your opportunity because you want to be able to fix uh, the epiphysis in an anatomical position. And he here we see uh, uh, a slip capital femoral epiphysis fixed with a one cantilated screw. And if you look at the AP view, yeah, everything looks quite nicely in place. But if you look at the uh, the frog leg view, you can see that the epiphysis on the, on, on the right side has slipped a little bit immediately uh, compared to one on the, on the left side. So it is important to fix it ASAP. <coughs> the complication of the surgery can be coronalized when your screw goes through the articular cartilage. If you try to reduce uh, a slipped epiphysis too forcefully, you can uh, create an avascular necrosis. And, and if you are not able to fix the epiphysis anatomically, it might cause some problems in later life because of the abnormal shape, and then it can lead to labial tears or uh, articular cartilage damage. <coughs> this is a 26-year-old uh, recreational athlete who, as you can see, had a slip capital femoral epiphysis, but uh, not anatomically reduced. You can see quite a big cam deformity on the left side with a, a, a decompression of the abnormality to give it a bit more normal shape and a label repair. On the right side, we did the same thing, but his label had completely worn away. So in that case, we did a, an ITB label graft to, uh, like, uh, to uh, replace the uh, uh, absent label. The next condition is hip dysplasia. It's a bit less frequent than, uh, than impingement, but much more frequent than slipped capital femoral epiphysis. And it basically means that the, the, the femoral head is, is not covered completely. And uh, those patients uh, who present with dysplasia during adolescence are usually those with a, a bit of a milder type of dys dysplasia. Uh, and, and, um, and often you see that when they start to engage in sports that they start to complain about pain, limping. Uh, some of them uh, had a breech position uh, at birth and, and often we see that there's a family history of uh, astabular dysplasia. The x-rays can help you, again, uh, you can see uh, the, um, the angle measured is, is what we call it the centrage angle, and um, the, the smaller that angle, the less coverage of the femoral head, and, and in principle anything below, the, uh, below 20 degrees we call dysplasia. Anyone who has an angle less than 16 degrees will certainly develop uh, osteoarthritis. Um, and, and then there is what we call borderline dysplasia with an angle between 25 and 20 degrees. Treatment is uh, preferably non-surgically with, uh, I would say, modification of activities, uh, physical therapy uh, to, to strengthen the hip. Uh, non steroidal but not just to play sports, but just to treat uh, the pain. And, and in some occasions, we do a hip injection with some generally not, not with steroids. Surgical treatment, hip arthroscopies are um, useful in those patients with mild dysplasia and label, label uh, repair, uh, label, label and label tears. But, but in those patients um, who have uh, a bit more, uh, well, a lower, lower center channel, sometimes a uh, osteotomy is necessary, and uh, sometimes uh, you have to do an associated, uh, so <coughs> com combination of, of, of a an arthroscopy and, and uh, an osteotomy. That brings back to the most common condition, femoral stubble impingement. Now, in the adolescent group, we, we can't always tick the same boxes as we can do with adults. And, um, and often, um, one of the most common symptoms is that there's uh, significant pain uh, after sports activities. And you see it um, more commonly probably in, in those sports where there are unpredictable movements, such as football and such as uh, rugby. And, and they complain about pains, uh, pain um, while, whilst you're rotating on the, on the weight-bearing leg. And often we find in, in this uh, group of uh, athletes that uh, they have a negative impingement test. <coughs> so the diagnosis is not always clear. The workup that we do is, is pretty similar uh, as, we do, uh, as we do in adults. I always test uh, everybody 
with we look at strength of the we do isometric strength testing of the adductors abductors we do um, uh, electronic measurement of the range of motion um, our imaging uh, first thing that we do is, is pelvic x-rays uh, in adolescence um, to reduce the amount of radiation we, we do frog leg views not uh, cross table laterals what we do in atl adults and um, and we like to do uh, MRI arthrograms, uh, preferably with a bit of local anesthetic because it, it helps. Uh, in, in, in that age group, very often you see that uh, patients have large wave sign, that means that they have an area of unstable cartilage, and very often you don't see a label, label tear. But, but if you inject a local anesthetic at the same time and it takes away the pain, then at least you know that it is coming from the hip joint. So these are the views that you take. Yeah, so an AP view, you see that clearly the cam abnormalities on both sides and that's a frog leg view uh, showing the cam abnormality as well. But can, can we ignore uh, hip impingement in athletes? Well, probably not because uh, in professional, professional athletes have a higher incidence of uh, osteoarthritis of the hip than compared with the normal population and <coughs> the incidence of osteoarthritis in, in, uh, uh, after prof professional football is about 10% which is, which is quite high. So, so are those athletes then uh, at higher risk to develop uh, AVI? Well, th there are two studies uh, who have looked into that and, and unfortunately they say the exact opposite. So, so one study says that it's not associated. Uh, they both published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine uh, with uh, about six weeks apart. I don't think they've had the same reviewers. But, um, so, so basically, um, what we did a few years ago was uh, we screened uh, uh, about four or five hundred uh, academy players from, from different uh, um, professional football teams and we found that uh, about 18% had a positive impingement test but, but none of the players actually had um, uh, issues, they were all pain free and were able to play. So, so therefore you have to be a little bit careful with, with tests if they don't give you the information that you want. So positive uh, Impingement test doesn't mean that there is an impingement issue because they're all perfectly able to play. Sometimes the diagnosis is not straightforward, and <coughs> so this is an example of a 12-year-old girl who had a hip and adductor pain for about a year. She was unable to weight bear without using uh, crutches, which she had used for about a year. <coughs> she had slightly reduced range of motion, a positive impingement test. Ricochet didn't really show anything. Um, abnormal and this was her uh, MRI scan and, and this is where the confusion started because you can see that that white spot uh, area of increased uh, uh, intensity so so back from the radiology the report back from the radiology came saying that there's a possibility that we have an infection and so hematogenous infection in adolescents are I would say non-existing, yes, so, but, but if, it's, if it's on the uh, on report then you have to consider it. Um, and, and, and possibly um, also uh, even, even a tumor, but, but, but if you look at the soft tissue involvement around, it, it, looks, it doesn't look uh, um, significant, so, so tumor could be disregarded pretty quickly. So, then, so we, we start to do bloods to look at all the inflammatory parameters to see if, if there was indeed an infection. We could exclude that, and <coughs> it, it just turned out that this area of increased signal was just uh, <coughs> the area of cam impingement, the uh, edema around the cam lesion. She also had an associated label tear. So, so, <coughs> so at the end, we did a, an arthroscopy for her, uh, cam decompression, label repair, and that forced she settled down her hip symptoms. But it wasn't something that you would dive in straight away. <coughs> it, it took a lot of consideration before you got before you get there. <coughs> now. In adolescents, how do they do with surgery? There is one review study uh, published uh, uh, this year, basically, and uh, they look at uh, the, the satisfaction rate following uh, impeachment mm -hmm. surgery in the adolescent is between 84 and 100% uh, with the arthroscopic technique and about 79% with the open technique. Because a lot of them get label of pairs, um, you can see that there is uh, there's about 3.7% uh, ad adhesions that have to be uh, removed and, and you see that 
with label pairs, the risk for adhesion is a little bit higher than, than if you just than if you would do a resection. So not but last but not least, um, I want to just touch on the apophysial injuries of the pelvis. I think it's 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 um, something that you have to uh, bear in mind uh, when they have a, an acute injury in, in the in groin area. Uh, things like sportsman hernias you don't really see. Uh, I would say in in adolescents you have to think more about about uh, apophysial injuries, something to the skeleton, and it, it, it can be confusing because. The, um, <coughs> the pelvis has about eight ossification centers, and they all um, they, they, they present, present well, they, they occur around uh, adolescence, uh, age of 17, and, s and some of them take about until the age of 25 to, 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 uh, to close. So, this is a 70 year old um, academy player. You can see uh, this is the pubic symphysis here, you can see the, uh, the bony fragment here, and um, this is just a uh, an apophysial injury of the of the adductor longus, um, so it's not uh, it's not an avulsion fracture. But we see that quite often. Eh? You can see here the um, the two ossification centers of the uh, of the adductor longus. These are not avulsion fractures. These are just uh, normal variants that you can see, as you can see here on the uh, on the on the 3D CT scan as well. Those little fragments are are normal basically. Avulsion fractures. Of the of the pelvis have a, a peak age around uh, thirteen point four years old. It's, it's more in, in males than in, than in females, and and um, soccer and gymnastics are the main sports. You can see that the most common one is the uh, ischial tuberosa avulsion, which is basically the hamstring that that avulse followed by the anterior in inferior iliac spine. So this uh, this is an example of a fifty year old uh, rugby player who is uh, kicking a ball prior to the game and he felt sharp pain in his left groin area. The pain settled to some extent. Well, they wanted to see uh, a consultant about this. So um, so on examination, the only thing what I could find was some pain over the erectus femoris insertion. On your left side there, you can see the, um, the avulsion uh, of the uh, ischial uh, anterior inf inferior iliac spine. So, so you've got your diagnosis there. And, and this is with conservative management and stretching, is something that settles very easily uh, within three months. But sometimes, um, this, this was an example of a, uh, a young athlete uh, who had normal x-rays. And here you can see that there is a, again an avulsion of the um, inferior uh, iliac spine, as the blue arrows show. And you can see here very nicely, uh, this is your uh, rectus femoris tendon. This is the straight head of the rectus femoris. This is the reflected head that attaches above the acetabulum. You can see the avulsion here. And again, once again, uh, within three months, they are, are able to return to sport uh, with no further problems. This is an example of um, initial tuberosity avulsion, as you can see here. But sometimes uh, things can, they, they can have complications. And this is also initial tuberosity avulsion, but you see, uh, following the avulsion, uh, that patient developed a large ossification. And uh, sometimes it can give you uh, even the impression of a, of an, of a, of a bone tumor, of an osteosarcoma. Um, so, but this, this uh, was a 13 year old girl who uh, was a sprinter, and um, obviously she, she wasn't able to sprint anymore with such large mass in her hamstring. So, on the right side, you can see a um, resection of that uh, bony fragment. I left a, a few little fragments there because they were attached to the sciatic nerve, so you don't want to uh, play around there too much, but, but that was enough for her to return to her sports activities with uh, no problems.